I was deployed as an infantry team leader with the army in the Kunar province of Afghanistan from 2008 to 2009. One night we set in on an observation patrol to overlook a village that we suspected IEDs were coming out of due to a successful IED recovery a few weeks prior. My lieutenant gave me a new thermal imaging system called the Recon 3 that none of us were familiar with and were told me just to figure it out. I started messing around with the Recon 3 to see its capabilities and I was surprised with the clarity of the images and the clarity of the zoom on it. I spent most of my time messing with the different functionalities and watching the village. I started to look across the valley to see what I could see and that led me to look upon a spur that we had set in on and I saw a very large heat signature at the top of one of those false peaks. I did everything I could to get as clear of an image as, as I could, suspecting that it was a group of Taliban huddled together around the light as they tend to do in the mountains when all of a sudden the heat signature stood up as one being. It started taking steps parallel to my position and was covering ground quickly with ease. Its stride was slow and relaxed, but yet it moved with incredible speed. That led me to believe that this creature was indeed gigantic. It traversed along the landscape and I lost sight of it along a neighboring spur. I did not believe what I saw initially, assuming that I imagined it and had never seen anything like it before in my life. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the journey. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop is just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. Luke, you're, you're looking festive over there in your black hoodie. Okay. Yeah, you and your camp, you and your camp Nephilim <laughs> shirt. Dude, very festive. Listen, dude. listen. Dude, you're, <laughs> is that you're what, the least festive guys right now. Is that what you have to wear when you enter the bone zone? You got to have the proper it uniform is. on? I have to wear the shirt that says Camp Nephilim on it today because we're going into Nephilim territory. We got Tales from the Grid Square coming up. He's, uh, he's our new friend and he's got a great Instagram account. He curates stories of from the military about all kinds of weird stuff, paranormal things. That's in the bone zone because he's talking about ancient places and military bases and creature sightings and giant stuff. Dude, so he's got he's got the uh, the military entrance into the blurry verse. That's right. He found that military door. Not only did he find it, but uh, he tells a great encounter. Nick's great. I'm excited about this one. He tells a lot of tales, everything from Bigfoot to giants to Dogman. We love it, man. It just gets blurrier and weirder. And appreciate uh, all the people out there who take a chance on us and come on and tell some stories. Some real fun encounter stuff lately. You know, we had our, our friends Levi and Micah talk about their encounter with the Wendigo, which is a members-only episode. So if you are not a member, you definitely need to become a member just to check out that story at the very least. But there's a whole catalog of exclusive members-only episodes. So if you are not satisfied with a single episode in a week, we have the solution. We have the juice, Nate. We got we have extra episodes along with a, a ton of other perks. And The juice. You know, the silver lining there is you to support the podcast and what we do. And at the same time, you get access to platforms and channels that are just for members, merch discounts, extra episodes, members chats. If you're a gold member, we have a movie night once a month where we watch a film. Went through the David Politis catalog and we're on to some, some new stuff. I think the Fall Brothers stuff may be coming up. Still need to have the Fall Brothers on, P.S. Yeah, we do. I'm working on it. I work on it in the background. That's right. Cancel your Disney Plus subscription and add Blurry Plus. They're like the mom in Wedding Crashers. I never know what he's doing back there. What is he doing back there? I never know what he's doing back there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we got we got the man in uniform coming on the show lately. That's right. We got cops and, and military men. Thank you guys out there who listen to our show and take it take us serious enough to come on and tell your stories. We know there's some sort of liability involved with that. So we appreciate those dudes for coming on and 
and being willing and honest to share their blurry encounters. And if you didn't listen to last week's, if you didn't listen to last week's episode, I'm gonna say this coming episode here is gonna fit really good into into a theme that just sort of happens for us sometimes. But listen to Kevin's episode about his encounter in Indiana. It is a mind blowing experience. And if you did listen to that, this is a in- very interesting follow up from the corners of the earth where our men and women in uniform are encountering. Very blurry creatures, Nate. That's right. And we're going to try to find even more of those stories. If you had a story, shoot us an email, blurrycreaturespodcast at gmail.com. More and more uh, people coming out in the woodworks and telling us their their weird stories, and we appreciate that. And if you ordered something from Blurry Black Friday, we have those on their way to us, and then they're coming to you. So thanks for being patient, all you guys who supported the podcast, whether it's a membership, a t-shirt, all the good stuff. And we now have a guest section on our website. So if you love the books from the previous guests, including our buddy Nick, who he wrote a book on and who's coming up next, you can go get his book right now. BlurryCreatures.com slash guests. Yeah, check out the library. All of, all of our guests uh, that have books, we continually update that site so you can find you know all everything from... Doug Van Dorn, Derek Gilbert, Dr. Judd Burton, the entire Blurry crew, even our friend from Tales from the Crit Square has his book, and that'll be it's, the link's available on our website. So, just another way you can support the, the people that give their time to the show. And we're in from Tim Alvarino mm-hmm. to Dr. Laura Sanger. You know, we keep bugging our buddy Derek Olson; he needs to write a book. So when he does, it'll be up there, Nate and Travis too. Come on, Travis from Giants of Ancient America. Exactly. All these guys, and soon the Blurry book is coming. Right, Luke? The blurry book is is coming, right? It's going to be a little less exhaustive than Fritz Zimmerman's account of every every mound in the Ohio Valley. <laughs> but uh, may, maybe someday it'll be a coloring book with our, with our level of uh, acumen here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, we appreciate that. Everyone out there sponsoring the, uh, the show, becoming a member. BlurryCreatures.com slash members and BlurryCreatures.com slash guests if you want to get a book. All right. All right, all Let's right. Let's get blurry by the minute. Our big fella just stays in the woods. Did you see my dad in the Bigfoot costume? Dude, I loved it. I have it. I have it now. I brought it home. Are you are you going to put it on? No, you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see how it is. I see how it is. You are, and we're going to go to Noah's Ark in Kentucky. <laughs> and they're not letting you in. They're that like, sorry, only two by two animals, and sir, you are not allowed in. <laughs> I woke up sick, but I'm not going to cancel. A little difficult to uh, <laughs> kind of set, schedule these meetings when I'm living literally across the Pacific. You're living in a t- terrible place, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's not, you can't be Hawaii for the most part. Are you on Oahu or Kauai or where are you at? I'm on Oahu. Yeah. I remember when I was in high school, we took our senior trip to Hawaii. Remember, you could rent those scooters and just cause havoc. You still can. It's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, the military guys got mad at me. Yeah. You were just smooching with girls in the back of the bus. That's what you were doing. I was trying. No one wanted yeah. to smooch this ginger. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, thanks for coming on. Uh, I don't do you, you don't want us do you want us to tell your name or no? Because you kind of uh, hide your identity on your Instagram, so I figured. Yeah, you can use Nick Orton. It's like my uh it's been like my ghostwriter name or my like uh pseudonym that I use. Or just Nick or Tails. Well, all right, Nick. That's good enough for us. Thanks for coming on Blurry Creatures in the wee hours of the morning over there in Hawaii. Can't say thanks enough to you for coming on our podcast. Last week, we had an episode about someone who saw a, a Nephilim creature when they were a kid. And Kevin came on and told our story. And before that, really the only rumored encounter with a giant that was like infamous was the Kandahar giant in Afghanistan. Yeah. Which, you know is a military story and that's kind of what you do you curate military stories people from in the military send you their stories from all over the world you put them in one location on your instagram page and you kind of share those stories so thanks for coming on our podcast and uh love to hear about maybe there's some other kandahar giant stories out there that we haven't heard about oh yeah and if uh, your listeners are listening you know if, you, if they love blurry photos i do have a few blurry photos <laughs> that people have sent in <laughs> um i got uh always <laughs> always blurry nick they're um, always blurry I, I actually yeah. I, there, there's one that i don't got is blurry and it was uh uh because i guess it's really not hard to blur because it was it's literally three lights in a triangle at night over a fob and or and, no it was a, a bigger base it was a bigger base in afghanistan 
during like 2013. It was yeah. like what you would have that that triangle UFO shape, that perfect triangle UFO shape floating over this really big secure military base, and no one saw it because you could only see it through MVGs and this guy on duty was just kind of like looking around at his MVGs and he like looked up and he was like, what is that? Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, if uh, your listeners are listening, if you go to my page, Tales from the Grid Square on Instagram, uh, I do have some yeah. occasional photo stuff in there. The most recent one uh, being a ghost ghost girl from Okinawa that's known to haunt one of the, the military bases there called Camp Schwab. Um, and this guy took a really blurry photo a while, from a couple of years ago. <laughs> and uh, but if you look at it, it looks like a what's descri- what's always been described there is a ghostly little girl in a white dress. Yeah, we actually did an episode with our buddy Shay, who was a listener, and he came on and told his story. This guy worked at a hotel in in Japan, and he was in the bottom bathroom smoking cigarettes, and this thing came in the bathroom and stood right in front of his stall. Pretty crazy story, man. It was it was pretty spooky. No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, hard yeah, we forgot um, our quintessential question. We always kick off the conversation with we ask all our guests what they think about Bigfoot. That's just how we do it. And I for, sometimes I, I forget to ask. <laughs> well, we've been, go, uh, we've been going so long. Don't ask me about Bigfoot because I feel like we'll be here. We'll be here for the next like three hours. But uh, <laughs> you can do a real. You can do a quick version, a recap. Yeah, what do you think? I definitely think it ex- uh, Bigfoot exists as a flesh and blood animal. I think there's just too much circumstantial evidence and accounts and just stuff from recent times to, you know, ancient times with the first tribes and the first people to discount it completely. I don't, I don't think there's more of a paranormal aspect of than it's a undiscovered species, which I think are a lot of like what is known, what cryptids are known as, or, you know, uh, these, some of these legends from past, they're like, this literally, I think it's literally just a gigantic North American ape. That doesn't like people and has eluded us for all these years. Yeah, and and we get a little more into the weird on our show. We talk about the weird stuff that happens and associated with these creatures. You know, we're not we're not we're not afraid of that. And it's hard, man. It's it's such a he's a confusing one. The counterpoint to that is I think all the other weird the the weird stuff people see in the woods is like something else entirely. Um like the vocalizations and people see, I think uh that those are so like, you know, the skinwalker meme, right? So skin, skinwalker is basically like a meme yeah. now, especially like in the military. People say skinwalker all the time because it's like a joke, uh, but not really. It's like really, but not really kind of thing. Like if you know, you know, kind of deal. Um, yeah. But like, you know, all skinwalker mm-hmm. is, is really is a Navajo legend of a shape-shifting shaman. But if you go talk to people who've been out in the woods, they see they've seen and heard things that are so bizarre. They equate them to a skinwalker, not Sasquatch a skinwalker or a windigo or whatever. And I think that there's this other cryptid out in the woods, like, you know, the pale crawlers. Mm-hmm. I, I really buy into yeah. that. And I think those exist. The rakes. The, the rakes. And I, I have yet to determine or decide if they are physical creatures, again, like an undiscovered animal, or if they are like legit paranormal entities. And I think those, co- those are what is causing a lot of like the, disappearances the the vocalizations the weird stuff in the woods just because i've heard like so many stories and i've i don't like watching videos because believe it or not uh for running a paranormal page uh, i'm a huge scary cat like you know <laughs> i'm like no nope, i don't want to go look up videos i'll be here all night and <laughs> i'll be freaking myself out and not going to sleep no, I, I get it. That, I mean, some people, some people say Bigfoot's like the protector of the woods, and I wonder if you know he's like helping people from getting abducted by these things, keeping people safe in the woods. I want to believe that's what Bigfoot does, but I mean, to be fair, like I've seen videos of these like rake things, and I don't know. I think I think the three of us here, I think we could take them on. I think I think I could take one of them. You're a little skinny. I think I got I got enough beef, I got enough beef here. Man. Like I work out. Like I think I could, I think I could take one down. Yeah. Like I think they get the drop on people, uh, just like I think. Sasquatch could potentially get the drop on people. Like, uh, I listened to the Sierra sounds that one, one the first time, and I was thinking, like, I was like, wow, yeah. these guys almost got got. <laughs> I think, yeah, I, yeah, I think those things were like came there to jump them, and they saw that they were like in the little shelter, and they just sat there all night. And I was like, wow, you know, those guys, maybe those guys were about to get attacked by those things. Who knows? And hey, and Nick, and in, in you know, you collect a lot of accounts and stories in in the military space. Do you ever come across anything? People send you stuff about about having encounters, you know, with Bigfoot as far as military encounters or, or brush brush up oh, yeah. with the big and guy? I'll have to like preface this with my little statement is like 
So like I, uh, everything I talk about and like post about on my page, like, so I am in the military, but like, it's, this obviously doesn't reflect the, the views of the DOD department of defense or, you know, the U S army or any sure. other branch. Yeah. Uh, I gotta say that I'm just like a regular guy. I just like paranormal. I've liked paranormal like topics ever since I was a kid. And then I kind of realized that nobody's really kind of branching into this realm of like the military and the paranormal because it's actually a lot more prevalent than I thought it would be. Well, well I mean, yeah, you you got to think you've got, you've got soldiers and troops all over the planet that are going into some of the more remote places, you know, and operations and things like that. You've got to think that they bump into weird stuff, uh, especially because Nate and I, like he, he had said, and we're prefacing that saying like this, you know, we, we've been getting weird for, for a few years here, but you know, when you're, when you're going to crazy places, and you're doing doing operations and potentially you're you know you're armed as well there's a lot more that we don't obviously don't hear about because the government keeps caps on things as you would say this is your opinion and not the opinion of of the entities and that's probably a given (laughs) but you got to think that that happens you know um which is a fascinating place to be for you just because to think you know i hadn't really thought about that a ton but you know if you're you know, in Kandahar, going you're, if you're if you're rooting out the Taliban in caves, if you're in the jung- deep jungles of, you know, of Southeast Asia, if you're you know all these places and deep in the ocean, all these different places that the military ends up doing, you know, operations. You, there's got to be stuff, right? Yeah, and you know, absolutely. And I think the other part of this too, and it's like other the other like my goal is to like you know help bridge that gap in my own weird way between like this the military and the civilian world. Because to be honest, like to your point, I think a lot of times I tell people it's not that like the government is hiding or covering up that you know these people have these encounters, witness things. It's like just literally because you know when you're operating or when you're working or when you're out there, it's like you know oh I just saw you know I saw Bigfoot just stand in front of me and walk away. Well, anyways, I have to get back to my job because if I don't, people people are going to yell at me. People are depending on me. You know, it's yeah. like sometimes when, you know, the, the sergeant tells you, hey, shut up. You didn't see anything. It's not because he's covering it up. It's because he really does not want to deal with having to explain to everyone how you just saw Bigfoot and we have a lot of work to do. And it's something as literally simple as that. And then I don't know. And then some other times there might be some crazy stuff going on where they're like, hey, you saw nothing. Sign this NDA. Well, yeah. And people people right. don't understand like how many agencies there are and how many hands are tied for you know one agency can do something and another agency can't it's not as easy and cut and dry as the government you know the more we get into our show i mean we just did an episode just full disclosure about an, a navy chief who was on the USS Nimitz when they filmed that tic tac and he said everyone knew what it was, but nobody felt compelled to say anything. They they didn't want to talk about it. And this was 2004, right? And now, 2017, they're talking about UFOs, and they're bringing military guys on these shows, and they're saying, hey, this stuff's, we don't know what it is, but it's out there, And but these guys have to keep a lid on it, you know, for the last 20 years, and now all of a sudden they're talking about it. Well, and to your point, they... You know, he said that they made everybody sign an NDA. Yeah, they did. You know, at, at that point. And he, he was in the intelligence a- aspect of it, but he's like, yeah, everybody basically had to sign an NDA from the pilots and everything else to not say anything, but now the government has released those videos and stuff. There, there's certain things they can't talk about because it's public knowledge. But And not only that, he said there were better recordings of that UFO, but they released ones that aren't aren't as good. So that's interesting. He said they didn't release the better videos, just the more blur, most of the more blurry <laughs> ones. <laughs> right? Which yeah, is good. Always. Good for us. Yeah. It's weird. I, that's all I gotta say. But yeah, it's not as easy as the government. Yeah, and like, and sometimes it's literally like you know, if I was to talk about the topics I I talk about now, I'll just be known as you know Nick, the guy that likes Bigfoot and UFOs and stuff like that. I won't be known as you know the guy that can get stuff done or the guy that can be relied upon. So you don't want to like jeopardize sure. your. <laughs> right. It's it's literally sometimes that simple, and other times it's like literally like, hey, you're not going to talk about this, but. Sorry, well, we got sidetracked. <laughs> we can, uh, get yeah, we did. So yeah. Bigfoot. And what about some of the other stories where people say that, you know, there's these night reconnaissance missions where the military is thinning the population, going out, hunting them down. What do you think about all those those claims? I read some of those stories, and I'll, yeah. I'll just be honest. Like, some of those stories with, like, the military, it's just like, I don't know. I'm just like, what unit is doing this? Because, man, I can't. I can't. When we <laughs> do, my unit deployed to Europe. In 2017, I could not get my soldiers to stop shutting up about telling everyone we were deploying. I was like, dude, like, we're not supposed to talk about this. Stop it. 
And, you know, people yeah. people always say, yeah. like, Special Forces, the Ranger Battalion, stuff like that. Well, you know, then I beg the question. Like, guys in the military know, like, those dudes are busy. Like, those guys are constantly deployed, constantly training. And it's just like, where can you fit this in somewhere? So I'm always curious. Like, I mean, it could always be, like, in another agency disguises the military. But I've always wondered, like... You know, is it really the military? I heard the the Green Berets are associated with some of these like missing four one one cases. Yeah, because um, I uh, I think it's that one's more towards like you know, honestly, those guys are they're trained to hunt people. Um, <laughs> when someone goes missing, you know, why not bring if the best trackers are available? Why not bring them in to track those track them down? Right. It's very fascinating. But to like go back to your point, what we were originally talking about with Bigfoot uh, is actually yeah. So I, I've I've gotten quite a few stories from military members about what they allege to have seen or like have encounters that they attribute to the Bigfoot phenomena. And, you know, if you, for the listeners that don't know, like military bases, they're all over the United States, right? Um, and if you just look at the main army ones, right, we're not talking like National Guard or the reserve bases, you know, honest military army bases are in Marine Corps bases to an extent are typically placed on massive amounts of land in the middle of nowhere. Mm. And, you know, and to be honest, like for the training areas, right? So there's like the secured Katoman area, which is where like all the offices are and barracks, right? And that has like a gate and a fence typically. But then like the training area is usually like unfenced. There's like literally a sign that says you can't walk onto here. This is federal land or danger, you know, live fire area. And because it's so massive, if they just have this hard time patrolling all this, I live in Hawaii and our one of our training areas is literally across the street from where I live. And it is a massive jungle. It it, it is so massive. Like there are people that trespass in there all the time because they can trespass from places that our our military police have a hard time getting into, you know. Um, And so Mm -hmm. it's I tell people it's like, you know, if there was a creature wildlife that's out there you know soldiers are typically loud they make a lot of noise they smell you know they can probably send something coming from a mile away <laughs> and slip out and marines too sorry marines and dip out and oh by the way like when we have all these training exercises we leave a ton of trash behind and a ton of food waste it's probably heaven for them out there but yeah i get mm-hmm. stories um all yeah. the time popular places for bigfoot specifically fort lewis and uh, Yakima Training Center, which is up in Washington State. Mm. Fort Lewis has always, JBLM, Joint Point Base Lewis McCord, has always had this, like, you know, kind of legend of, you know, Sasquatch being out there in, you know, in the training area. How do you get these stories? It's all through Instagram right now, because that's kind of, like, the easiest social media site. would love to do, like, a podcast like you guys, but, uh, you know, I'm still active duty. And, uh, unfortunately, my mm. like, current kind of work pace and job and time zone difference prevents me from, like, kind of diving into this. Uh, so I do things through social media, kind of got inspiration from another page uh, called Battles and Beers. And he basically, he collects war stories. If you guys like war stories. And his is the same format. He's on Instagram. You so I solicit, or you can come message me directly or send me an email. You tell me your story. I, I, ask, I ask you maybe a couple more questions or like whatever. It's like we have a conversation to try to get some more details. And then I take that and I'll post it or I'll save it for later. And I'll tell the audience why I save it for later, but I'll post it on the page. In like a kind of easy flip book format so people could read it and it's mm-hmm. really easy for people to enjoy uh awesome. or sometimes if i like the story and i think it's like a real a real mind bender or a mind, mind boggler i'll take it and i'll save it for the book series that i'm writing and i have my first book out we could talk about that at the end yeah what are some what are some mind benders yeah, some Ooh, of, okay. yeah tell us some of the best stories you've got some of the craziest ones uh, okay, drop okay. some drop some on us here nick so uh if you were it's so always i always preface if you guys we were talking giants so i will bring up the yeah. first kind of like mind bender story I got, and I'm not gonna, it's, it's pretty mundane, but I'll just go ahead and read it for you guys. So, this is the story I was deployed as an infantry team leader with the army in the Kunar province of Afghanistan from 2008 to 2009. One night, we set in on an observation patrol to overlook a village that we suspected IEDs were coming out of due to a successful IED recovery a few weeks prior. My lieutenant gave me a new thermal imaging system called the Recon 3 that none of us were familiar with and were told me just figure it out so I could pass on that information I learned about it to the other team leaders. I started messing around with the Recon 3 to see its capabilities and I was surprised with the clarity of the images and the clarity of the zoom on it. I spent most of my time messing with the different functionalities and watching the village. I started to look across the valley to see what I could see and that led me to look upon a spur that we had set in on 
and I saw a very large heat signature at the top of one of those false peaks. I did everything I could to get as clear of an image as, as I could. Suspecting that it was a group of Taliban huddled together around the light as they tend to do in the mountains when all of a sudden the heat signature stood up as one being. The trees in that area grew to be about 10 to 12 feet tall and this thing was as tall if not more elevated than the trees that surrounded it. It started taking steps parallel to my position and was covering ground quickly with ease. Its stride was slow and relaxed, but yet it moved with incredible speed. That led me to believe that this creature was indeed gigantic. It traversed along the landscape and I lost sight of it along a neighboring spur. I did not believe what I saw initially, assuming that I imagined it and had never seen anything like it before in my life. I didn't tell many people about it when I was deployed or even in, in the army later, and I kept it to myself thinking it couldn't have been what I saw. But then in 2010, after I got out of the army, I was listening to the Coast to Coast radio and I heard the story of a C-130 pilot talking about a similar creature. The memory came flooding back to me and it made me consider other things I saw during that time on the service. The C-130 pilot discussed the creature in detail and said that it had fire orange hair. And they reminded me of a tradition the locals would do but would not speak of was when they would dye their hair orange and dye their hair their goats orange. It seemed like this was every once in a while they would do this and all of a sudden the orange goats would be gone and the orange would be out of their hair as well. I didn't put two and two together, assuming that it was a weird cultural thing I didn't understand, but now it makes me wonder if it's some kind of gesture to the creature or Nephilim if the goats were sacrificed to it. I'm a Christian and the Bible briefly discusses the Nephilim, aka the men of renown. I think that is what I saw. I think it is an ancient race of giants that are descendants of fallen angels, or it could just be a Sasquatch-like creature. I'm not sure. Of course, I only saw it on thermals, but it didn't ex appear to be hairy like what you would expect a Sasquatch to be. It just looked like a huge naked man. Dang, I like that. Yeah. There's, some, there's some nuggets in there. Oh so yeah. So they dye their hair. I didn't. I never heard that before. So I looked it up, and, and so in Islam, I think it's uh, it's it might be. I'm probably gonna get this wrong again because it's it's early. <laughs> uh, yeah, but they 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 will dye their hair for like it's tradition to like dye your hair like uh, green or different colors for Ramadan. But I couldn't find anything that directly alluded to orange. So that was kind of weird. And like that story is uh, funny. So I actually have other mm. giant stories yeah. that are like almost exactly Let's like go. that. They're, unfortunately, they're kind of boring. They're just kind of like they're literally just like that. Like dudes are sitting on like hey, patrol. Give us a couple more. Give us I a couple to, more. Okay, let me. I'll have to pull some of those out. I'll give you a. Uh, here's a. Uh, I, I love it actually. Because there, there's so you... many Bigfoot encounters. These ones are more fun to me. They're oh, few yeah. and far between. You know? I was gonna try to give you guys some. Uh, nice like kind of a spread of different stuff i'll take a break of uh this is one of my favorites because it's just incredibly weird yeah this is this will be something different from what you guys have heard <laughs> i'm sure the only thing downrange i saw downrange were dudes taking a piss in the morning or shit early at night in the middle of the night never saw anything weird but one of our dudes recorded some weird shit with a bedouin sheep farmer <laughs> and potentially some machine or something it didn't make any sense and we still can't, can't explain it to this day this happened around the first quarter of 2018 in Syria. We always saw these goat farmers in the middle of nowhere. They always had these little huts made of random material, and they moved every few weeks. This one night, in this one sortie, we had zero sensor taskings. So they started watching this farmer walk around his hut. These farmers usually had a type of motorcycle or a moped, or a Hilux, or a truck, or something like that. Well, this one farmer hopped onto his motorcycle, but the weird thing is, he started driving it straight towards his goats. This dude was going uh, reasonably fast, like 35 miles an hour. And suddenly he was flying over his goats. The weapon safety officer got about 25 seconds of this dude hovering around and flying, but we couldn't make any sense of it. Our intel officers thought that maybe he had jury rigged a quadcopter, but it looked like a motorcycle. Our intel actually submitted the report to the higher ups as a incident report. This farmer was flying over his goats in a flying motorcycle contraption, and it didn't make any sense. And our pods that we use to monitor don't have any errors or parallax errors that could produce something like that. The likelihood of a Bedouin having that type of equipment isn't realistic either. So the response we got back from the Intel shop was they simply didn't know what it was. So somewhere out there, there's a, uh, a Bedouin farmer watching his goats with his flying motorcycle next to wow. it. 
Dude, that's wild. <laughs> that that sounds kind of spiritual to me. You know, obviously he doesn't have the money to to buy the tech. It sounds like something something else. Sounds like some sort of seance or some sort like of like a witch on the broom. A witch on a broom, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we know. <laughs> I actually ended up calling that guy to talk to him more about it. And he was like, yeah, we all sat there and watched this guy. And he was, there's, if you go look up like quadcopter motorcycle, there's one in like Dubai that they built. Of course, this thing is like almost a million dollars or I think a million yeah, dollars. Yeah. No Bedouins got, yeah. unless he's sitting on an oil field, he's got, got a fucking yeah, motorcycle. I don't know. Maybe, dude. you know, Tony, Tony Stark is out there, you know, as a, as a Bedouin farmer somewhere in Syria <laughs> walking around, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I'll I'll, I'll, through it. I'll give you another one here. I'll try to give you a spread of like some of the weird stuff. Yeah, dude, love these. Keep them coming. Okay, so this is uh, Keep them uh, coming, one of one of my favorite ones. I was a Marine sniper in the platoon deployed to Fallujah, Iraq. The Marines went in the city of April 2004. I operated as a sniper and I was assigned to the Quick Reaction Force. We roamed the outskirts in the gun trucks to enforce safe movement of the civilians out of the city. On the second day, we got word that we're, we might be moving into the city that night. We had our battalion give us a moto speech, and at the end of the day, at zero th- dark 30, Marines were patrolling the city streets with bayonets secured to the front of their rifles. I had a day pack in my back and slung my M4A3, M4A3 with a day-night scope slung over my body. We make our way through the streets and hear a small shootout with the enemy forces, but we keep moving. The enemy eventually gets defeated, and we make, continue to make our way to the edge of the main highway that cut our city in half, the north-south. We climbed up a one-story building and set up our sniper position on the roof ledge. A gunship was circling above. We had a fireworks show in front of us and we got front row seats. The gunship ordnance hit weapons and ammo caches which caused a huge fire and explosion. I was scanning across the street through my night scope, which was less than 100 yards across the street. Then I saw a shadow figure dancing. It was the shadow of a crouching enemy with an RPG slung over his back. I later found out that he was holding a grenade that he was planning on throwing at the QRF. As I see this guy through the night vision of my scope, I put my crosshairs in the right side of his head and I pull pressure on the trigger. Right before my trigger breaks, the guy makes a quick head movement forward and I miss right behind his head. So I quickly shoot another few rounds of 7.62 into him. And it was pretty good hits, but not good enough for him to die instantly. So I just watched him roll around in agony as he slowly bled to death. And this was about 3.30 in the morning as we watched him. We heard him moaning and crying, but his friends didn't come to get him. And as the sky starts to turn blue, the morning prayers come on. The man was singing through the loudspeakers who watched this wounded enemy roll on his stomach, still moaning and crying. Just as the prayer was on its last note, I looked through my scope and I saw this wounded enemy pick up his head and look right at me through my scope. I felt his glare, which caused the hair on my back of my neck to stand on end. I swear he saw me. And when the song ended, so did his life. His head dropped right as the prayer ended. And that was that. What a trip. I was telling my observer about this guy, and he just brushed me off and said to look for more targets. The battle went on throughout the month and with great success on my end. As the Marine and the Army battalions were told to leave the city of Fallujah, the QRF was the last ones to the exit. We get back to our base, turn to personnel, gear accountability, and let the dust settle. It's now 2 a.m. on base as I make my way back to the head for a long shower. I get back to my hooch and I lay on my rack. I check the time and it's about 2.30 a.m. and I fall right asleep. After a little while, I wake up to something or someone slam their hands on my bed right near my feet, and I start to get sleep paralysis. I'm trying to fight this feeling as a person starts crawling, hands and knees on top of me, and then it sits on my chest while it's holding my arms down. My heart is racing out of my chest. I could not move, and this thing was pissing me off. So I fight the sleep paralysis and push this person off of me. I quickly get out of bed and turn on the lights, and I look around, and no one was there. All five guys in the hooch that were sleeping with me and at separate beds started to yell at me to turn the lights off because they were fast asleep. So I did, and I brushed the counter off and lay back down. But I knew who it was. It was the spirit of that first enemy I killed on that first night. He paid me a visit that night to scare me, and it almost worked. I brushed it off, and I went back to sleep. Wow. It's a freaky one, right? Dude, creepy. Dude, that's gnarly. And those are like those weird stories from... uh, like combat that I'm trying to trying to capture. And, you know, I tell people like, look, I don't have, you know, I don't have time to sit there and check all the, you know, the facts and whatever. And so like, you know, for the naysayers, it's like, Hey, look at, at, at the very best, take these stories as true. I mean, it's like, I can't verify them, but at the very worst, you can just consider them entertaining fiction. Like 
you know, I was not there with that guy. I don't even want to betray my age here, but I was probably like in uh, middle school at that time, maybe. Right. I was, yeah. you know, like I was Fallujah. <laughs> I can't imagine fighting in Fallujah for your listeners, listeners that didn't know. It was a pretty intense battle, both the second and the first one in the beginning of the war and the second one, which is, you know, kind of stuff of legend in the Marine Corps because of how an intense battle that was. And uh, I'm still exploring kind of like that realm yeah. because I've heard that there's some weird stuff that happened during that battle as well. Yeah, I mean, people can kind of, you can kind of smell real quickly if they know what they're talking about, if they're making something up, if they don't know the, you know, the terms and they don't understand like the, the whole environment that you get as being in, in the military. We, we kind of do the same thing on our show, Nick. Like we hear a lot of stuff and sometimes if it's, we just, if it's just too crazy or weird, it's like, I don't know. But, but after a while that the same thing starts coming at you, you got to kind of, well, there's something to all this. Your mind expands and the weirder stuff is, is available. But did I like, I like those stories, man. And that's a cool place to be. And the military doesn't probably, you know, kind of bring the, uh, the people in that are making up stories. It probably, it's not, it's not that crap. I, I mean, people do unfortunately um you know some people are very bad storytellers like uh i'm also very well versed in like internet culture and like i've you know the, the creepy pastas and i used to browse yeah. uh 4chan a lot on the paranormal page when i was a kid and like i can i notice when people are trying to parrot me something some information so i i try yeah. to do my due diligence of like thanks for sharing bro and kind of pushing it to the side uh, or for the most part, like I let like kind of like the audience kind of give input and, you know, maybe when they're on that training mission and they heard this shrieking in the woods, they thought it was a woman. It was really a fox. Yeah. You know, or maybe not. It was like uh, the first time I heard a, a doe bleat in the middle of the night. I thought it was like a ghostly woman coming to collect my soul. I was right. freaking out. Yeah. I got a fox that lives in our backyard. Yeah. I know what that sounds like. Yep. <laughs> and then I, I started hearing yeah. them all go off at once. And I was like, oh, that's what deer sound like. <laughs> but. I have a video of a Marines in a place and somewhere in the uh, West Coast that, you know, depicts what kind of like one of the legends they talk about there. It sounds it legitimately sounds like a woman screaming in the woods, like just like I don't know how to describe it. And like I've heard cats, foxes, I've, I've heard all recordings of owls. Uh, I've heard like, you know, like big cats, like big cats always have that like, like I don't know how to describe it. It's like a draw at the end. Yeah. When they, all you gotta do is listen for that, and like once you hear it, you're like, yep, that's a cat, and all all cats do it, and like this one, it, the mountain it's lions just like this. do do have that weird. Yeah, being from California, yeah, you get a weird bellow um, that's it just sounds human. It just sounds like a woman yep. bellowing and yep screaming, and like it's it's very strange. And then you know if you get into that that base that they're from, it lines up with what people experience and people see out there. So you know, and maybe it is Sasquatch. I don't know. I love it. Not that giant that that guy saw through the scope, 12 foot. Well, the trees were 12 foot. And he was That's what he estimated. Them, right? Mm-hmm. Dang. Yeah. Like, so we, 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 the story we told this week was about a 14 foot guy that um, he saw in trees, but that was in Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> so it's wild, man. You know, we hear these stories and, and we, and we emailed him for a long time just to make sure, you know, and I think, like you said, there's just only so much time in the day to to try to vet these stories. I mean, obviously, if it, if you're coast to coast, yeah, I don't know, maybe you have a little more time. But for the rest of us, we're just like, hey, do with it what you will. What do you think about this story? Is it good? Yeah, or bad? who knows? And you're absolutely right. And that's like honestly all you really can do at this point because you know we may never have the answers, but you know we can kind of start getting there, maybe. Um, we can start like encouraging people to talk. Yeah, we've heard a lot of rumblings in Afghanistan and giants. It's cool to get a couple stories about that because that's that's what everyone seems to know. Yeah. Oh yeah, and Once like I've come to giant space. learn. You know, I never really deployed to uh, Afghanistan. That wasn't like in my in my story to do so. But talking to people who did deploy there, they all kind of <laughs> unanimously agreed with me. Agreed to me that uh, without talking to each other, that is such a weird place. Like. To the locals, it's a weird place. You know, it's an ancient place. It's, it's you know, there's stories of giants, like the locals talk about it. There's stories of like what we would consider like Sasquatch, uh, Dogman, 
um and you know and some of the uh yeah. what's what's the other one like the gin if you go look into the stories of the gin there like to like the um in places like afghanistan and pakistan the gin aren't ghosts they're not like these paranormal things they're like fact of the matter like when the villagers are saying there's gin there they really mean it there's something there that is an evil ancient spirit that just don't mess with it it'll leave you alone but if you go there and mess with it it's gonna yeah, mess with you I've, I've been to kabul in 2017 so i've been to afghanistan i could tell you like the atmosphere there is weird in general and i didn't get out into the like the you know out into the the bush or out you know it wasn't on any fobs it wasn't with the military but just being there there's you, you nailed it there's something very ancient it's super like mountainous and rugged once you even even surrounding the city there's it's this wild rugged place like it is and there's just something that there's an air there that's it's heavy it's heavy it's it's just a i can't imagine being deployed i have friends that were deployed you know i I've got a few buddies that were there multiple times and not surprising that there's, there's strange things that happen. You know, it seems that we have things that happen in the, in the remote parts of this planet. And the more remote you get, sometimes the more weird these things are. Yeah, man, there's a lot of caves too, right? We talk about caves, Nate, and, and the things that, that come out of caves or you can overlay cave maps in the United States with oh, yeah. one stuff and you can find all kinds of weird, you know, things that line up and then, you know, and then you look at what what the people are oh, saying is yeah. coming out of caves in you know other parts of the world. A, it's it's um, wild. For like, I like looking into like local le- like legends to bases too. So like, uh, like you talk caves. Uh, there's for a lot of Marines that are stationed on Camp Pendleton, and you know, on in California, there's another. Mm-hmm. There's all these little sub camps within Camp Horno. Is kind of the one that's uh, close to the water. It's like if you're driving up to San Clemente. Uh, it's off to the, if you're driving up north to San Clemente and you're, you pass, like you start getting in the middle of nowhere and the ocean's to your left, uh, Camp Porno, you eventually pass it. And it's like not marked on your, uh, your right. There's just this big Marine camp out there in the middle of nowhere. And a lot of the Marines out there talk about how they, the Horno Skinwalker, how they've seen and heard this weird creature out there and that there's all these caves that the Marine Corps has like not really designated but like people have found supposed entrances to them and you know they some of the marines out there think that there's like a creature that lives in these caves or creatures Mm. that comes out and uh there i Mm. even talked to a squad there's a squad out there called um this thing their moniker is the skinwalkers and i was like oh that's really cool like why'd you guys choose the skinwalkers because there's other squads and Units in the army that use like Wendigo or Bigfoot because it sounds cool. And they, they told me though, it's because their squad yeah. leader claimed that he had an encounter with a skinwalker as a child and that the skinwalker had been following him his whole life. And they said, like, one night in the field, they started hearing these like weird noises and these like screeches and growls. And they saw this human head well, not human, but this pale white head pop up and look at him from the bushes and then pop back down. And the, you know, the squad leader, matter of fact, was like, uh, yep, that's hey. the skinwalker I told you about guys. It's just follows me. And from then, then on, they've been known as the, the skinwalkers. So I kind of like, oh, like what? well, people, <laughs> yeah, people don't understand some of these. See, it makes me think, you know, it's like, why are these military bases where they are? Why are they, you know, why are a bunch of military operations in these, remote parts of the world what's what's actually the the reason that they're there because i mean if you look at camp pendleton it's literally right off the the coast of california next to catalina island it's right there and there's a lot of ufo activity and if you look into the history of catalina island they dug up a a bunch of giants there there's supposedly an underground megalith right in the right in the water there too it makes you wonder like is the military actually like looking out for the, some of these, is it building sites around the world? Is it in places where there was ancient megalithic structures and there's paranormal activity that's been going on since the dawn of time? I, I, I tend to think that they don't tell, you know, the guys on the ground all the information and some of the higher ups to know, okay, we're here to, we're here to watch this thing. Make sure this doesn't get out of control. Yeah. I mean, you, you could honestly be onto something just because of, some of the stories I get from the sheer volume of service members, it kind of begs the question, a crazy place uh, for your listeners. I actually wrote a whole article on it for the Lethal Minds Journal, uh, which you can find on Instagram as well. But uh, Fort Campbell is no, all the soldiers like just kind of know and say that the, the training area is haunted. 
and uh, like they see ghosts. There's even a road called Ghost Road because people driving down it had seen so many apparitions and like shadow people. Mm. But kind of like one of the hidden stories there everybody talks about is Dogman. Uh, there's a lot of soldiers there that report seeing literally this like giant wolf like creature or hearing these howls and growls in the middle of the night or seeing these big red eyes staring at them from the bushes um, and feeling these overwhelming sense of dread like you need to leave. And uh, I actually was able to like I had a bunch of soldiers message me and I uh, put two and two together and I realized that all of these soldiers. These five soldiers were from the same exercise on the same night telling me the same exact thing of what they saw was a giant wolf man creature that was trying to get the drop on them in the training area. And actually, I, I couldn't talk to the guy. I could not find him because he got out of the army. So if you're listening to this, please contact me. <laughs> uh, but supposedly one of the one of these soldiers witnessed another soldier get grabbed and dragged through the woods by this creature. That actually was like it's it was flesh and blood because it tore his uniform like with perfect claw marks. I'll give you the I'll give you the first story. There's I'll uh, I'll have to. Uh, it's pretty long if I read the whole. Um, we might be here for a minute if I read the uh, the whole article. It's fine. I think it's fascinating. We've got five people talking about a, a wolf man, dog man, werewolf sort of thing. That's that's a lot of witnesses. Yeah. I that's the only thing I've seen in my life, Nick, just to give you a little heads up. I saw one of those as a kid. Kind of blocked it out till later in life until I heard a lot of people like coming on podcasts talking about I'm like, wait a minute, I saw that. I thought I just imagined it, you know? Yeah, because like, I, I know. I, so I have a theory to this too. I'll read before I read the stories is I did, did some research. And uh, so I know you, I'm sure you guys watch Tony Merkel's um, uh, YouTube video that he did for uh, Legions of Legends about the Dogman, right? Yeah. So something that like instantly stood out to me. I mean, honestly, for the viewers who haven't watched it, the watch it is super fascinating because you get to let's hear the vi- the witness and kind of see how he's reacting. And then just honestly, the last five minutes are some of the most like bone chilling things I've ever heard. So I don't want to spoil it. But one of the things that these guys kind of all described at first was when they saw the creature, they described it as having antlers. Right. Mm. And I was like, well, what do you mean by that? Can you describe more of what she saw? And they started describing the face. I'm like, well, so was it more of like a wolf or was it more of like a deer? And they were all like, it was a wolf. And then suddenly they're like, it looked like it had antlers. And then all of a sudden it didn't have antlers. And I kind of like started putting two and two together. And I was thinking like, you know, these guys, could it have been a skinwalker? Like what we, what or the spirit, right? So the trail of tears did actually happen at you know and if you guys didn't know that was like more or less like the you know the kind of a really messed up period in american history where we forced all the tribes from the east coast and it's more or less a death yeah. march and it went all over the united states to what's now known as the reservations across america and it did pass through um kentucky and where fort campbell's training area is now or fort campbell is so tons of dark negative energy spooky stuff like I don't know. Maybe it could be that could be a remnant of the spirits out there that, you know, the cursed land, very, you know, the very spiritual people. Maybe Dogman is just a manifestation of these first peoples and like their suffering and like their anger and whatever. I don't know. It's very interesting. But I'll go ahead and get into it. So I got, I have, and it's funny enough, I have five stories. No, this is four stories here. The fifth man, he didn't want to kind of go on record, but he more or less kind of backed up everything this, the people were saying. Uh, so I'll start with the first story. Uh, so this first story takes place. This guy was a scout. So he was in the same exercise. And as the scouts, he went into the training area first, right? So the scouts go for in first. They go ahead of everyone. Uh, so this is what he saw. So while I wasn't in 1502, that's the, the infantry unit that those guys were in, I was in the Cav Squadron of the 2nd Brigade. During the November 2017 FTX field training exercise, we were conducting an area recon about 1.5 kilometers southeast from the training town called Cassidy. It was around two in the morning. We were sitting around waiting for further orders. And as we reached our line of advance, which is that's like kind of like their limit of where they need to go. While sitting in the truck commander position, monitoring the, com- the communications, a presence began to emanate two meters in front of our truck. And by presence, I mean a black mass. It was darker than the surrounding nighttime environment. And it was a, cl- but it was a cloudy night with little illumination. And we could still see this black mass in front of us. That was undetectable by MVGs or thermals and was only visible to the naked eye. 
Everyone in the vehicle confirmed they saw something in front of us with their own eyes. My gunner tried to pick it up on thermals and MVGs, but couldn't. Everyone in the vehicle felt like we were being stared down by this black mass in front of us and it wanted us to leave. We could feel the eyes on us. After about a 30 second standoff, this presence just vanished into the woods. And while I didn't feel threatened by it, I never felt that any soldier was the baddest thing walking around the back 40 after that. The back 40 is the training area. So now we get into the actual story. So this is the first gentleman that sent me the story that got me onto this. And so now we're talking, now this, this is the next three are from the same unit, same battalion and two separate companies, but they were all next to each other when they saw this. And so I'll just see how, like, you can see how similar their stories are. I'm stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. The training area we have is called the Back 40. Thousands of acres of ranges and training sites. My story takes place in the Back 40 near a makeshift town called Cassidy. It's located in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by forest and thick underbrush. And at that time, it was mid-July, so everything was in full bloom. My company was conducting a two-week field problem in the area. And after we secured this town, my platoon was tasked with pulling a blocking position about 100 meters to, into the wood line from this town. So this was like day 12 of a two-week field problem. And I'm located on the far right area of our blocking position with my squad. I'm a squad leader in the infantry platoon, and we dig into the position. I'm located about 10 to 15 meters from my soldiers with my back up against the tree. Darkness sets in in the back 40 and the guys retired. My team leaders are doing their checks to ensure the guys are awake. I always go by and I didn't keep track of my time, but if I had to guess, it was around midnight. No move. The only thing you could see to our rear was the town of Cassidy. My team leader was, was laying in with his team on the line and we're pulling about a 50-50 security detail so no one, so it's one man up and one man asleep. The Bravo team leader is sleeping next to me. Our radio man was walking back and forth, bouncing along the positions and checking on everyone. So every 20 to 30 minutes, I hear him walk by and eventually he comes up to me and says, hey, Sergeant, you good on batteries? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good, dude. So hearing him walking by so much, I get used to hearing the movement around me. But so then I hear something and what I've been thinking about, I ignore it thinking it's my radio, man. But it starts getting closer and closer and starts getting like slower and sounds more deliberate in its movement. I look over my shoulder to say, what the fuck are you doing? And that's when I saw whatever it was, mid crouch pose about 20 meters from me making low, subtle growling noises like a dog or a wolf. I froze and I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand and my heart start to race. Whatever this thing was stood at least five feet tall, crouched over and was slowly sinking lower and lower to the ground like it was about to pounce. Paralyzed with confusion and fear, I watched for another 10 to 12 seconds. And then I reached and grabbed my e-tool, it's a small shovel, not taking my eyes off of what I'm looking at. I Quickly flicked down my PSQ-20s, which are night vision goggles, and I, I, as I did, this creature ran a diagonal line from me fast. And when I say fast, it was booking it in this low crouch stance. I flipped my 20s to thermal mode, and I saw the outline of this thing running into the woods. Everyone heard me around me heard it crashing through the woods. It was too fast to be man, too big to be a deer, and it was fully standing up as it crashed through the bush. Later that night, another squad leader told me he heard deep, loud, sniffing noises near his position. The soldiers were saying they smelled what appeared to resemble a wet dog smell. In the hours before uh -huh. dawn, we all heard this loud guttural noise that would start up immediately after the coyotes. Coyotes are prominent in this area, and you could always hear them. Except after this howl or loud noise, they would all stop. I'd always heard stories and never believed it, as, well, as well as others in my platoon. After this encounter, we all agreed that we are alone that night and something lurks out there. It was canine by the looks of it. It was dark, and I don't want to speculate or give a false tale, but it's but in the face, it was elongated like a snout and for what I could see. Growing up playing in the woods and hunting, I'd never seen, heard, or felt anything that way ever. So this is the second guy. So this guy was behind that squad leader. Uh, so I was in 1502. Our company had just taken Cassidy after about five days of, a, of an FTX. Naturally, we could push out to the wood line and set up a defensive position for the follow-on mission. And naturally, as soon as we break into the woods, it starts raining on us. At this point, dudes are spent, annoyed, and pushed out and tired. But we set up our perimeter anyways, and to our left is a ditch running perpendicular to Cassidy and paralleling our sector. The squad leader and myself are co-located with the gunner and the AG. As we lay in the fence, we end up leaning back on some trees and <laughs> by the side and waiting for the end of the mission or the change of the mission. While smoking and joking, minus the smoking, since at this point our cigarettes are soggy mush, up walks a platoon RTO and switches out our batteries. We noticed them early due to the leaves and the twigs and the sound of 140 pounds slowly walking towards us. So as not to catch, to catch a trip or a thorny vine. He makes a swap and walks off. About 20 to 30 minutes pass and we hear the same weighted footsteps approaching. None of us had our nods on or down. Assuming it was the RTO, we just waited for him to say something. After a moment of silence, awkwardly, we went, hey man, what are you doing? And there's no response. We heard this deep sniffing sound from behind us. 
It sounded like a dog trying to find something. Hmm. The sound seemed to come from a few meters back behind my squad leader on my left. That's the first guy. That's the second guy I talked. Uh, we sit and listen, trying to figure out what was there for a moment. And then immediately the sound of leaves and cracking breaks and breaking towards us. And we hear this heavy sniffing between me and my assistant gunner. And we ca- it catches our attention. Immediately we both drop our nods and flip around and see what it was. At this point, we hear the source of the sound barrel into the woods on our right. And it sped down deeper and deeper into the wood line. All of us sat there dumbfounded what happened, and we concluded it was too heavy to sound like a coyote. It steps on more like sprinting on two legs rather than four, so we ruled out a, ho- a hog or a skunk or whatever. So we concluded it was the dog man. I'll note that we were all aware of the dog man, in it, be it in the back 40 or the land between the lakes. The funny thing was, our company first sergeant was super into the lore. And as you guessed, we mentioned it to him, and we got some huge backstory, mentioning that the stuff about the land of the lakes, land between the lakes, and stuff that happening all the time in the, in the training area. There was another soldier who was here that he didn't want to go on record, but he more or less like also with, he was right next to these guys. He was the assistant gunner and he saw this wolf thing barrel out of the woods, like in barrel into the woods. And he was like, yeah, dude, it was a wolf. Dang. Um, so this is the, this is the last one. This one's a super fascinating one that goes into our conversation of like, maybe people know it's there. Maybe people don't. So this is the final story to this event is, so I'm with the 101st Airborne's 1502 Infantry Regiment. There are rumors and superstitions among the infantry about skinwalkers and old Native American spirits. The Trail of Tears runs right through the base, and there are tons of unmarked graves that the Army has either ignored or, like, forgotten about due to the lack of funding. But anyway, one night, during a four-week training density in the back 40 of Campbell, my buddy and I are pulling guard on a road under MVGs. We're laying down on the side, and there is a storm drain pipe running under the road horizontally about a couple feet to our 7 o'clock. It's dark, light drizzle, and about two in the morning, and I'm watching the road one way, and my enemy is watching, my buddy is watching the other way for enemy. Next thing I know, my buddy is rolling around, hooping and hollering about something touching him. It grabbed me, bro. Holy shit, it grabbed me and tried to pull me into the drain. Not exactly sure what was going on, but I peeked my head into the storm drain to look. All I heard was grunting like a boar, and then the distant but sound of human feet slapping the concrete as it ran. I stepped back from the drain and aimed my MVGs across the street towards the exit of the drain pipe where my buddy crawled away. What I saw standing across the road in the tree line, 75 meters away from us, I can only describe as a legit dog man. It was eight to nine feet tall with the head of a canine, the body of a wolf, and it was standing on its hind legs. Hmm. Broad shoulders, and I couldn't tell if the hair was dark or with leathery skin. But I did see the ears, pointy and large, almost elvish-like. What stood out to me the most was when I was looking at it under nods. The eyes were glowing. Upon seeing it, I yelled and let off a burst of sim rounds. I'm not going to lie, it scared the complete shit out of me. The dogman turned and disappeared into the woods, knocking down trees as it went on all fours and ran away. It snapped some, several smaller saplings in half as it ran away. Six to seven nights after that incident, I was behind my CEO and my company RTO under nods again, walking through the thickest shit you have ever seen in your life. And I mean, thorn bushes 10 feet tall, thicker than concrete. The whole company gets separated, and I remember hearing it howl in between the platoons. So much so that the CEO called up on the net to ask what, who the hell is making that noise and what is it. Hmm. No way it was a normal animal moving through the type, that type of brush we were all in. It was freaky. Some of us were later called into our first sergeant's office and we retold the story. He basically told us to keep it to ourselves and never say anything about it to anyone. But I honestly still think about it and I can see the eyes. Huh. Right, wild, right? Um, That's wild. <laughs> and like talking to a lot of those guys, yeah, like all the soldiers kind of like, even when they're back in their training area, like their yeah. their barracks and they're, you know, they're on the edge of this training area and they all hear the howls and, some dudes see like eyes staring at them from the forest, hear stuff, smell it, you know, and some of the, the commands just like, hey, man, just don't talk about it. Whether that's because they know it's there or they're just like, we really don't want to deal with this right now. It begs the question, like, is there something out there? And, you know, and is it like it's obviously a physical threat because it, it grabbed a dude and tore his uniform? Yeah. You know, I don't know. And they're told not to talk about it. And you got to You got to have some stones if you're. Some creature like that, it's not a, you know, you're, you're messing around with military people. <laughs> or, you last. know, every time, anytime. So here's a red flag for your viewers. Whenever you hear these stories about guys are on a training, you know, they're walking around with live rounds on a training mission. That's a huge red flag, right? Because like we, and we're in, when we're doing training scenarios, all because you, know, you give someone gun, you give someone gun with bullets, someone's going to end up getting shot on accident. Yeah. For on purpose, there's yep. people like that. But uh, so like when you're in the field, you've probably seen it. Those little like red things, little yellow things on the end of the rifles. 
right? So that's where if we shoot blanks, which are just basically, that's the sim rounds. It just makes a loud noise and a flash um, to simulate like kind of like the rifle firing. And so like, you know, these dudes are, these creatures could also know like all these soldiers will walk around the woods with all this, these sim rounds uh. that don't do anything. And they're like, what a perfect time. They know they can mess with things and like get close and not have to worry about getting shot by like 50 dudes at once. Makes sense, actually. Yeah. They, they got a bunch of pop guns and yeah. not, not any, uh, dude, not any rounds. That's, that's why. Well, yeah. My thought is just trying to rule out a human, you know, another human being out there playing a joke. I just don't think that would be plausible. Uh, yeah. I think, <laughs> I think like playing a joke in that scenario that I, I don't know, I, you would get caught. Like I'm, there is, there is no one that smart. Now I've come across, Guys that have told me, like, I'll post a story about, like, some noise or whatever. And, like, some, I've had one guy come forward and say, hey, that was actually me. And I can prove it. And he actually proved it because he, he said that I was here at this time. And I put on a ghillie suit to intentionally go and mess with this unit. And, you know, I was, I was able to conclude that this guy was legitimately telling the truth and he played a prank. But I don't think a lot of these stories are pranks at all. Like, I think a lot of these stories are... You know, uh, so some of the stories I think are mistaken identity, for sure. But I still, I still want to post them and give people a voice. But I think the vast majority of them are legit, weird things that are happening. And whether it's Dogman, Bigfoot, UFO, whatever, there's an there's an explanation in there somewhere. And it's just we have to figure it out. You know. And what do you think? What do you think, Nick? What do you think? How's your uh, sort of understanding of these weird paranormal stories evolved? Oh. Where are you at with it all? That's a good question because I, my viewpoints on these things have changed like exponentially. You know, I've even started, my dad's in the service uh, or he's retired, but like, you know, I've even started getting stories out of him. And my dad has always been like a skeptic. You know, he's like, hey, I'll believe it when I see it. But even he's like mentioned stuff to me and I'm just looking at him like, you don't think that's really weird? Like, you know, you don't think what you <laughs> yeah. saw in the sky because he's a pilot. But that was not a, you know, an aircraft. Like you think the only thing that's weird, and you know, I, there's so many more stories. I think guys are just holding on to because it goes back to that, you know, that factor. I think just you know, it's the terror you laugh off in the moment, and like you know, you're just so focused on what you need to do, you just push it to the back of your, your head. You know, that, that that's what happened with me with some some other weird stuff I saw. You know, I pushed it back into the back of my head until, like months later down the line, it clicked in with me when I was bringing it up with another service member who was there. And we both found out we had a shared experience and that's where it got the ball rolling for tales from the good square was like you know there, there are these experiences out there but like people just kind of push them aside to the back of their head so like let's let's see what we can pull up and man if i pulled up some stuff it is definitely uh i sleep with i sleep with the yeah. light on in my house somewhere because <laughs> you know uh i don't i don't it's just like i'm like i said i'm a huge security cat i'm very superstitious and you know I think, especially out here in Hawaii, uh, if you guys didn't know, out here in Hawaii is extremely spiritual, extremely like, you know, there's a lot of haunted places out here on the island that you just simply can't get to because they're like deep in the jungle. And the locals don't want to take you because, you know, if you ask some of the locals, they'll tell you the activity is demonic, which is mm. insane. But like, uh. you know, I have dudes here that have experienced things and seen things, uh, you know, that I... I don't want to divulge too much, but I work very close to a fame. Like there's a famous picture of Pearl Harbor. Uh, right. And then there's like the Wheeler army airfield was the first place to get attacked. Um, there's a very famous picture of some buildings on fire. And I used to literally work in the building that was on fire in that picture, you know, and they, of course they rebuilt wow. it, but that hangar that was bombed and set ablaze and killed all these, all these ver uh, army personnel that used to be literally my office. You know, and so there's all sorts of like weird connections, like Fort Sill is built on an, yeah. on an Indian reservation. There's grave sites all over Fort Sill. Yeah. There's also a hidden history on these army and military bases and Navy bases that, because uh, we're just really bad, honestly, about recording our own history that's forgotten about. Yeah. You know, and so it's like, that's just, I like that niche subject and trying to bring some of this stuff to like, you know, awareness and, you know, in my own way, kind of capture veteran stories and like record them sorry i kind of got sidetracked there <laughs> no 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 we've heard all, we, we've heard it all man someone told us the hawaiian observatory is uh is a portal <laughs> <laughs> so who knows man i mean so much weird stuff dude if anything on our show every single island whether it's Cat catalina sardinia 
they were like, these ancient giants live there. And so who knows what they built there? And who knows if Hawaii wasn't inhabited, yeah. you know, a couple thousand years ago by <laughs> some giants. Or, you know, if you go to, I was on Kauai recently for a trip and there's all these ruins all over Kauai. And so there's a legend of the Manahune in Hawaiian culture, which are like dwarves and gnomes. And so like on Oahu, they talk about the Manahune like they're like these ghost creatures, like ghostly creatures, spiritual creatures. On Kauai, they're treated like they were physical flesh and blood. And there's all these ruins all over Kauai that were found when that are documented. They were there before the Hawaiians came there of the Menahune. And that on Kauai, the Menahune were literally like mm-hmm. the people there. It's a lost civilization. And I think someone, I found the document. I have to go look for it again. Even on the census in like 1801 or 1810, there were six people on the island that identified themselves as Menahune. It makes you wonder. So, yeah. Makes you wonder. Yeah. Huh. Kind of sounds like Easter Island. There's this whole history there too. We've done we've done a lot of episodes on these islands, specifically around the world, where there there's there's like a little remains here and there. And sometimes, you know, obviously Hawaii is one of the most sought after places to live in terms of when it comes to an island. But you know, there's there was places in Aruba, Easter Island. You know, like we brought on a girl who said there's a bunch of stuff in Aruba. And Carousel and places like that where, you know, you have this history that the people know about, but then, you know, the scientists come in and have a different narrative. But the locals will tell you, nah, there's this other history on this island. So it's one it's it's Luke and I will have to take a business trip out there and just and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, dude, we'll have, yeah, we'll have to. We'll take expensive. Yeah. <laughs> it is expensive. I definitely feel it on that. <laughs> We'll, we'll look for some giant bones and ride it off, right? That's right. There you go. It'll be a business expense. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks for getting up at, I don't know, the military time. 0400? Yeah, pretty so, much. Is that what it is? <laughs> I was like, I was getting up like <laughs> doing this. Like, we're commit. I'm up, we're committing. I, mean, I, I had my, set my computer up in my garage yeah. just the, uh, the night before. I was like, we will, like, we'll waste no time. We will waste no time. We're, we're getting blurry in the morning, at the morning hours here, <laughs> yes, we are. here Luke. Very blurry hours. <laughs> I know. I've had no coffee or anything yet. I'm just like staring yeah, at the we're, wall. We're way, ahead. we're way ahead of Nick here. So we don't have a lot of excuses. I know. <laughs> yeah, you have. You got a lot of energy for uh, early this is, in the morning. This is now, so over there. Once, once lunch comes around, that, that's when it starts crashing, comes crashing down. I love it, man. If, if you if you ever hear any of those giant tales and you, and you want to send some of those at military guys our way, we're always looking for more of modern day sort of Nephilim encounters. We we love those. So we appreciate you um coming on and dropping some no, you know, I, stories about cryptids and Bigfoot and giants and weird floating motorcycles. Dude, yeah. I try to Maybe give uh, one of those. <laughs> yeah. I try to get I try to keep it fun on the page and I try to keep uh, you know, like I appreciate you guys having me on. I do everything I do is uh kind of grassroots. Like I like basically, you know, this this is how I get awareness out and you know it's like i don't i tell people i don't care about followers on my page but you know the more people that know tales from the grid square and know how to find me you know i have more of a chance of getting a story for every you know 10 people that follow one of them may have a story or you know some dude like seeing all the other stuff i post is like you know what like i'm ready to tell you my story and you know the flip side to all this for the the listeners is uh so you can i'll just go ahead and i know we're uh getting short on time but uh, yeah. you know your listeners can find me uh, Tales from the Grid Square on Instagram. That's T A L E S F R O M T H E G R I D S Q U A R. Tales from the Grid Square on Instagram. That's where I primarily do all my business. Uh, you can reach out to me in the DMs. Give me a follow. Read the stories I post there. I also can be reached on email. Tales from the Grid Square. Same thing at gmail.com. If you want to shoot me an email, that's easier. Um, and I, I also, part of the second part of this project is I take these, I'm taking these stories and I'm collecting them into a volume of books, uh, nice. that I, I'm doing myself. Cause you know, like mm. digital age, you get banned, blocked, whatever. But you know, I have a book out yeah. now with 240 of these stories and you know, no matter what happens, like if all the books are suddenly taken away from people, I have one in my house. <laughs> so it's on paper and in my opinion, yeah, like, man. it's, it's talking hard copy. Hard, it's hard, hard put that in the safe. That's right. Right. Um, well, if you are you are you selling that book? Are you selling the book? I am. Now? Yes. So you can uh, purchase Tales from the Grid Square Volume One. 
uh, on Instagram, uh, not Instagram, sorry, <laughs> Amazon. You can find it in the Kindles on Kindle too. Uh, it's available for the Kindle app. And uh, it's also available on paper copy in the Amazon store. Sometimes it's a little weird to search for it. So I'll tell you, it's not because you're blocking me, just because I self-published this. Send us the link to that. We'll put it on our website. We have a guest tab, so we'll throw it up there and people can oh, go awesome. direct to it. Direct Fire link, book. baby. Oh, that's, that would be awesome. And I am working on yeah. a, a volume two, a volume three, and I have a volume four plan. That's how many stories I have. Uh, that's amazing. But volume two is slowly in the works as I, I, I get in with everything else. But I will hype it up a little bit. That that one will have pictures in it. I have some really, I have a couple of mind blowing pictures in there that you guys might like. Well, I have one that you guys really like in there. I, I've, I'll take, I've taken some stories that are a little like, a little more interesting, a little more amazing. I've put those aside uh, for that book. So there'll be some stuff in there that I haven't put on the page. Mm. And you know, I, I make sure it's edited. I make sure I do it all myself. I put a lot, of, I put a lot of work into this, so I deliver a product that is enjoyable readable and that people can you know read again again and again again so awesome yeah man love it that's right listeners go out there adam tales from the grid square on instagram and go buy the book and dude appreciate you so much for coming on blurry creatures and yeah, mahalo mahalo bro <laughs> thank you appreciate aloha. It. yeah <laughs> aloha exactly. boys <laughs> <laughs> that's right and if you ha yeah like i said you're always welcome on our show if you hear any more weird encounters and tales and you think hey this is blurry this is for the blurry bros i'm gonna hit us up and we'll have I'll, you back i'll on. tell you what i'll put I'll, I'll send this invitation when i release the second book i will say there is i'll hype like i said, i'll hype it up there's a picture i think you guys really like um i don't want to divulge too much it's not exactly blurry but it's definitely interesting and we could uh potentially talk about that when, I, when I drop we'll do it so let's do it let's do it man that's awesome thanks nick appreciate let's it go, brother. Man. Oh, awesome thank you guys thanks dude all righty <laughs>